Hello friends, welcome to Let's Crack UPSC CSE. This is me, Dr. Siddharth Arora. And friends, we are continuing with our series of 75 hours one-stop solution to Indian polity. So my friends, I had introduced this a couple of weeks ago that we will be making a one-stop solution to Indian polity. Now you may wonder what does one-stop solution here entail? See, we had made several videos in the past, something related to Lakshmi Khan summaries, to NCRD summaries, etc., and so on and so forth. But what I realized is that most of the students are doing piecemeal preparation. That is, they're studying something from one book, they are taking care of another study material, something on the newspaper, something on the test series, etc., etc., but there is no coherence. Hence, I am planning to make 150 videos, each of which would be around 30 minutes. That makes a total of 75 hours as a one-stop solution to Indian polity. This will be greatly helpful to all of you in making a structured preparation. Another important thing that we have the same video recorded, the same contents, but in both Hindi and English in the other channel of ours that is called as Let's Crack UPSC CAC. We will be doing those things over there. But here the subjects will be taken care of only in English language. So this will be only for English language aspirants, those who are not comfortable in Hindi. Please continue watching here. Those who want this the same thing to be done in a bilingual manner, please uh, go to the other channel which is called Let's Crack You Basic CSE and you'll find the same video. Fair enough my friends. So I hope you realize that we are doing this for a particular reason. The single one point agenda for us is to help you out in some way or the other for your realistic preparation, realistic chances of passing this exam. Today, I'm going to do part two of historical underpinnings. The last video was part one. That is historical underpinnings till 1858. We will continue from exactly where we left from 1858 to 1950. That is till the time India enforced its own constitution. Another important thing that must be brought to all of your notice, my friends, that on a YouTube channel, it is not possible for me to cover up everything. It is just not possible. So if you want a preparation, which is intense preparation, which is one to one preparation with the educator, with me, with having unlimited number of doubt sessions, this is the course that we were all waiting for. Thousands of aspirants have joined this course. You may also join this course. This is called Comprehensive Course on Polity for UPSC CAC 2021. What is interesting here is that Un Academy has drastically reduced the prices. Those of my friends who are appearing in 2020, please take a one year course, a 12 month course, which is available for 40,000 rupees. Use my code SIDLIVE, S I D L I V E, and you will get an immediate 10% discount at 36,000 rupees. You will get this entire course. Those of my friends who are appearing for 2021, 22, 23 also, you're very, very lucky. You have more than two years for preparation. Take a 24 month course, which is available for 48,000 rupees. Use my code SIDLIVE, S I D L I V E, and you'll get the same course at 43,200. Do simple mathematics. Two year course is available for 43,200. That is only 7,200 more than the one year course that is for 36,000. Take a wise decision, but join now. No point wasting any more because the exam is very, very, very close. So if you recall from last video, we had started with first war of independence. Britishers call it the first mutiny. We call it the first war of independence. The reasons of that were very well known. So I hope you recall something about the Sepoy mutiny, the Mangal Pandey and Field P-53 rifle incident. Then the... Uh, doctrine of lapse and so on and so forth. Britishers, fortunately for them and unfortunately for us, were able to quash this rebel, as they said, and we lost the first war of independence in our language. Britishers took whatever they wanted to do, took all the steps, okay, and most of them were very cool steps, as you can see from the picture, okay, that they decided to get back to us, right? And they decided that in whatever way they would discourage us from any such adventure of first war of independence, kind of. Now, the Mughal Empire was over. This is the charge sheet which was filed against the last Mughal Emperor, Badur Shah Zafar. 
so you can see this okay none of these are available in your books so i just thought that you should be very well aware of this so this was the end of Badr Shah Zafar and the end of Mughal Empire, so to say. So the end of Mughal Empire was there, but this is a pictorial representation of Badr Shah Zafar being exiled to Rangoon. And this was the end of the Mughal Empire and we started a new phase. And that new phase was the Government of India Act 1858. Queen Victoria was declared as the empress of india and a new act was passed which was called as act for good government in india this we have already dealt in detail in the last video the act for good government in india added several features number one it ended the east india company's functioning in india it was completely abolished and all the government's powers were now taken by what is called as her majesty's government Hence, it was called as HMG or Her Majesty's or His Majesty's Government, as the case may be. The Secretary of State was made a very powerful office. He was given all the powers that were usually exercised by the double government. I hope you recall from the Pitts India Act 1784. So please understand, I'm making the entire story very, very easy and comprehensible for all of you. So these were the basic things that was done. The rule of British East India Company was abolished. Government of India was taken directly over by the crown with Queen Victoria as a supreme monarch. The crown was empowered to, empire, to appoint a governor general. Now this governor general office was now called as the viceroy. The viceroy was the direct representative of the crown. Extensive powers were given to the secretary of state and Queen Victoria who was declared, was proclaimed as the empress of India under her, the government promised us many things, that there would be quite a few things, including doctrine of lapse, which was discarded, etc. But our expectations were not completely met, not completely met, because actually what the British government had done was administrative streamlining. They had just made sure that the government will function in a better way, instead of changing much on ground. So most of our expectations were not met. There were very few changes made. Also, which we'll see later, that the Britishers started an appeasement policy towards the princely states, also called as the Rajas or the Rajwaras. So if you are asked, okay, such a question will be asked, what was the real achievement of the Government of India Act 1858? It was primarily administrative streamlining. However, things were changing and the things changed with Lord Canning. Lord Canning was the first Viceroy and he decided to pass what are called as Indian Councils Act. So under his Viceroyship, we had the first Indian Councils Act of 1861. The second one was 1892. The third one was 1909. You will do yourself a great favor if you remember these years because sometimes civil services examination will ask you direct questions with regards to years. Now, the first and the most important action, the first and the most important action of Indian Councils Act, or rather their aims, was to get more and more Indians involved. Lord Canning was a very smart man. He did not want any change or any possibility of a repeat of First War of Independence or the mutiny, as he, they would call it. And that is why he said the first and the foremost thing that we want to do is get more and more Indians involved. So the Indian Councils Act of 1861 for the first time had unofficial, also called as non-official members, which were Indians. Please remember they were included in the legislative councils. Now you may wonder why are they called as unofficial members because they were only nominated by the Viceroy. They had no powers whatsoever. Also a very important thing happened for the first time Lord Canning started doing what is called decentralization. In other words, the provincial legislative councils, I hope you recall, which had been completely abolished by the Act of 1833, were now re-established. And some legislative powers were now given back to the provincial legislative councils. Lord Canning also introduced the transaction of business rules for the government for better governing structure and streamlining of government functioning. He had already introduced what is called as a portfolio departmentalization structure way back in 1859. But now, by the Act of 1861, it was legally recognized. And what is very, very interesting, he introduced the concept of what is called as ordinances. So if I give one line definition of ordinances, ordinances are nothing else, but these are 
executive passing laws when the legislative is absent. Now you may be go revising your normal parliamentary structures, etc. Then you must have started this under Article 123 of the Constitution. That is, the President of India can pass ordinances when the Parliament is absent. So where have we actually taken this from? We have taken this from Lord Canning's structure in 1861. So 1861 was a good beginning. 1892 was the same thing, progressing at a faster pace. Now you would wonder why would there be at a faster pace? Because a political event had taken just prior to that. That was the establishment of Indian National Congress. And under the pressure of Indian National Congress, which was established in 1885, stronger legislative councils was made. So from six-membered body, it became a 16-membered body and there were more powers. Please remember, by 1861, the unofficial members, those which were made, the people who were, the Indians who were allowed to come into the legislative councils, they were having no power whatsoever. They were merely like they are sitting like guests and they were not having any power whatsoever. So if you know Raja Banaras, Maharaja Patiala and Sir Dinkar Rao were their members, the first three Indians who were ever a part of those legislative councils. But by the Act of 1892, now there were increased powers. Now the members could discuss budget and ask questions to the executive. A very important question has been asked in prelims with regards to this. When, there, when did the discussion of budget was given to the powers or, or to the legislative councils? The members of the legislative councils, it was by the Act of 1892. Also important part, although sometimes some texts use the word as indirect election, but you would do better if you don't use the word indirect election. But there were certainly better ways of getting uh, the members to the legislative councils. One amongst them was that now the recommendations of the Zamida systems and the recommendations of Bengal Chamber of Commerce were also taking part in the nomination or the selection of members of legislative council in addition to the nomination by the viceroy by the act of indian councils act of 1909 things are drastically changed especially because of the passing of what are called as morley minto reforms morley was the secretary of state of india and minto was lord minto the viceroy the central legislative council was increased from 16 members body to 60 members body even the provincial legislative council was increased in size, but it was not uniformly increased. Please remember there were two major political events prior to the passing of Indian Councils Act of 1909. One was the partition of Bengal, I hope you recall. And the second one was the establishment of a political party called as Muslim League. So Indian Councils Act 1909 wanted to capitalize on this environment. And this is what Lord Monumental reforms will be. We will see that later. You must remember that Mr. Satendra Prasad Sena, who was later Baron Sena or Lord Sena, who made a Baron later, was the first Indian to be made a member of Governor General's Executive Council. You might as well call him Vice Viceroy's Executive Council. It's one and the same. It was the Executive Council. Make no mistake about it. I did not say Legislative Council. But as I told you, Monumental Reforms would be better remembered for the introduction of what is called as a communal electorate system. The communal electorate system gave special electoral rights to Muslims. This was a part of the Britishers tried and tested divide and rule policy. This was the appeasement policy which ultimately led to a partition, but it was started by Lord Minto. Hence, Lord Minto is called as the father of communal electorate system in India. And then comes the great man. Mahatma Gandhi arrives on the scene. Now you would wonder why it was such an, such an important thing. That Mr. Mahatma, Mr. Gandhi comes to the picture of why it is such an important event in our country's history. The reason to that here is Mahatma Gandhi was able to galvanize the entire national movement. But before that, he understood and made the rest of the country also understand that India is not under military occupation of the Britishers. Instead, India is under legal and political occupation of the Britishers and that is why there is no point having violence as a mechanism or a method to remove the Britishers. We have to fight this battle in a legal and political manner. That is why Mahatma Gandhi must be and correctly be recognized as the father of the nation. He was on the most prominent reason why India was able to achieve his, its independence. Of course, nothing can be taken away from the lakhs and crores of people who have struggled with Mahatma Gandhi, 
but he gave us what is called as a road map to independence. Before we understand what Mahatma Gandhi did for us, you have to understand India. India at that time was this. So this was primarily the map of India at that time. If you look closely, if there are provinces, these are not given in your books, so might as well do yourself a favor and pay attention. So these are provinces, if you can read, and then there are princely states like Rajputana, Hyderabad, Mysore, Travancore, Kashmir, and so on and so forth. Now the problem was in the real sense, the provinces were colonies of England. In the real sense, the legal and political occupation was only true for provinces. The Rajwadas or the Rajas or the princely states, as they were called, had an arrangement with the Britishers called as suzerainty. In other words, it was told that the Rajas or the Kings or the Nawabs or the Nizams, etc., whatever, by whatever name you want to call them, they were practically having autonomy within their kingdom. It was only outside the kingdom that the Britishers will look after the foreign affairs and the defense of those kingdoms. In other words, if you look closely, then the Rajas or the Rajwadas or the princely states were actually not very, very keen of leaving the Britishers or joining the so-called Federation of India. So the major problem of colonization was with the provinces. Mahatma Gandhi made people understand this and we started demanding what is called as a federation. So if you read closely, watch this. Before 1957, 1947, two-fifths of Indian subcontinent was not British territory and two-ninths of its in inhabitants were not British subjects. Most of India is still now blissfully unaware of this situation or this arrangement at that time. This territory was divided into 600 individual states which were governed by hereditary princes of varying rank owing allegiance to the British crown. The states were displayed great diversity in size, population, revenue. So Hyderabad was very large, Kathiawar was very small, but either way, these were princely states. Now, what is very important for you to notice that the first war of independence, Britishers had understood that they had to appease. In other words, they had to get the support of these princes. And for that matter, they had created what are called as Chamber of Princes, etc., which you will see later which can get got the constitution sanction. So most people are not aware that there used to be a third chamber in the parliament also, which was called as Chamber of Princes. Today it is used as a reading house for the members of parliament. But the Chamber of Princes or the, the appeasement policy towards the princes was a hallmark of Britishers, again time-tested uh, divide and rule policy. Now what was they doing that they were always utilizing the princes and the Maharajas as their anti-mechanism against any national interest. So if there was any national movement getting through the provinces, it was being countered by the use of princes and the Rajas, etc., who had tons and tons of money. So the Britishers were always having the method, method of divide and rule. Sometimes it was between Hindus and Muslims, sometimes it was between princes and provinces and so on and so forth. Mahatma Gandhi understood this and Mahatma Gandhi made the country realize that the first thing that we will have to do is that the provinces and the princely states must come together and form a federation. And when the demand started rising, Britishers had to pass what is called as the Government of India Act 1919. The Government of India Act 1919 was passed by the Montague Chemsford reforms. So the Montague Chemsford reforms was there in order to have the first step to the roadmap to independence and the end of an old story that was the princely appeasement or the prince's appeasement. So this was the Government of India Act 1919. It says an act to make further provision with respect to the Government of India. Whereas it is a declared policy of the Parliament to provide for the increasing association of Indians in every branch of Indian administration and for the gradual development of Pay attention to the word self-governing institutions. So why would we be paying attention to this word? Because the on paper, the Government of India Act 1919 was aimed to establish a local government. Make no mistake about it. Don't confuse this word local government with the Panchayati Raj institutions and the urban self-government that you're wanting or studying nowadays. Here we were talking of the formation of provincial governments. So the Government of India Act 1919 divided or classified the subjects into central subjects 
and provincial subjects. In other words, on paper, the Britishers promised that they are giving us what is called as true division of power, but that was not true. Instead, they had given us what is called Diarchy, in which most of the powers were kept with the Viceroy in the Viceroy's list, and very few powers were given in the provinces called as Provincial List. Within the Provincial List also, there were two divisions. One was called as the Reserved Subjects, in which the Governor General was practically free to decide whatever he wants to decide. You can please don't mix up Governor General with Viceroy. Both of the things I am using it as synonymously. And the second one was the transfer subjects in which the Governor will act in the consonance with the ministers appointed under this act. Make no mistake about it, even the ministers were still under the control of the Governor or the Viceroy directly or indirectly. And that is why practically we were still under the control of the Viceroy. However, they gave us a Public Service Commission, which was called as the Central Public Service Commission by Section 38 of the Government of India Act 1990. This, however, came into existence working condition far later. Then a uh, condition was given, uh, a legal sanction was given to an Auditor General and bicameralism was introduced. Now, what is bicameralism? That was two houses. One was called as Council of State of the Indian Legislature, the other one was Legislative Assembly. Now, in a way, we would compare it to the present time Rajya Sabha, but don't do that because this Council of State was having very few powers. The still, all the control was under the Viceroy. So, in a way, there was no possibility of forming a federation because to form a federation, first thing we require was provincial autonomy. For having provincial autonomy, there should be true division of power and bicameralism, none of which was given by Government of India Act 1990. Also, the princely states were given a choice, quote unquote, it was given a choice that whether you want to join a federation or not. Now, I hope you are understanding that no princely state is going to take such a crazy decision and that is why India was not able to form a federation and Government of India Act 1919 was a failure. So, you can quickly recap, Government of India Act 1919 came as a result of Montague Chems for reforms. Legislature lists were separated but not the executive. Provincial subjects were divided into two parts, reserved and transferred, and instead of division of power, Diarchy was given. Landmark changes were bicameralism was introduced in the Indian Legislative Council, but as I told you, that still the Viceroy or the Governor General was the superior power. Another important part was separate electorate for six and Anglo Indians. Six and Anglo Indians were continued. So the communal electorate system, which was initially introduced for the Muslim population, was extended to six Anglo Indians, etc. So the divide and rule policy continued. Please also remember that never, never during the British Raj was universal aid franchise given to any of the Indians. It was always a limited franchise. Because Government of India Act 1919 failed, right? Uh, but a High Commission was established for India at London with some powers given by the Secretary of State of India. Because of the failure of the Government of India Act 1919, Mahatma Gandhi launched what is called as a non-cooperation movement in 1920. It was the first pan-India movement, although you must be aware that the Chauri Chaura incident led to its suspension, but still it was a very strong movement and it really caused much concern with the Britishers. Britishers, when they were passing, the Government of India Act 1919 had already decided that in 10 years we will revise Government of India Act 1919. But the pressure was so much that they had to appoint a Simon Commission in 1927. What was very surprising was that there were no Indians a part of the Simon Commission. Simon Commission's reports were later discussed in roundtable conferences and led to what are called as white paper and constitutional reforms. Simon Commission was met with huge uh, opposition from all quarters. I hope you recall the death of Lala Lajpat Rai and then the incidents related to Bhagat Singh, Chandrasekhar Azad and the other revolutionaries. This was the Simon Commission report which was published or rather submit tabled on in June 1930. These recommendations said were discussing the working of the system of the government, the growth of education and the developing of representative institutions in British India. What must very surprising my friends is that Simon report actually, actually proposed that India should be made into a dominion, but it never happened. 
and instead the Britishers passed the Government of India Act 1935 which you can safely say was one of the most important laws passed by the Britishers during the British Raj. What was very interesting over here was this was end of the diarchy system and that there was a, at the provinces level and the introduction of diarchy at the central level and for the first time ever provincial autonomy was given. In other words, you must remember this question. The first step of decentralization of governance in India was 1861. The first step of and the maximum decentralization was achieved by the Government of India Act 1935 or you can say Government of India Act 1935-37, whichever it doesn't matter. So Government of India Act 1935 planned to form an All India Federation, provinces and princely states together. Now there was true division of power into what is called as federal list, provincial list and concurrent list. You can very easily compare it to what is happening nowadays. It is called as union list, state list and concurrent list. Very important MCQ asked the residuary powers in Government of India Act 1935 was given to the Viceroy. Very, 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 very important part. Provincial autonomy was given, no diarchy, bicameralism in some states and the Council of India for Indian Affairs was abolished. Limited franchise was con continued. L the Reserve Bank of India, which had been established prior to this, before this was given le legislative sanction. The CPAC, SPAC and JPAC, the Central Public Service Commission, the State Public Service Commission and the Joint Public Service Commission was, that means there was trifurcation, I said the word trifurcation of the Public Service Commissions took place. However, unfortunately, India still did not form, to, form a federation. Why? Because the princely state said no. Unbelievable. So both the acts have failed to form a federation. The reasons were different but we failed to form a federation and now that brings us to a problem. The problem here is that Mahatma Gandhi and the rest of the Congress and the political leaders and the Rajas were not on the same page. They were, were having major disputes, major differences. You can see in this picture, Gandhiji is accepting donation. He was continuing a national freedom struggle with very limited resources. On the other hand, I just showed you the picture of Rajas. They had awesome amount of money and there had two different political understandings also. So post-1935, our Indian national freedom struggle had to be really re-looked re into because there was a logjam. This is what we wanted to avoid and suddenly something happened. In Europe, Adolf Hitler started the World War II in 1939 and he decided to destroy England. And for that, he ordered his air force, the Luftwaffe, to, dis to start what is called as the destruction of England. And we, and in England, they saw what is called as Battle of Britain. So there was huge trouble for England in Europe. And that is why England wanted support. So they sent the Viceroy Lord Linlithgow to our national leaders and gave on August 8th, 1940, what is called as the August Offer in which they said that we will we are ready to have expansion of governor general's executive council we will establish an advisory war council and we will give you a representative indian body which will form the constitution of india in other words they were principally mark my word they were principally ready to give us a constituent assembly in return for war efforts and this was the principal acceptance, but there were other things. Okay, so Winston Churchill, who was now newly appointed as the Prime Minister of England after the resignation of Chamberlain, appointed a war cabinet. And in this war cabinet, from this war cabinet, he decided to send a mission called as the cabinet mission called as the Crips mission. Now, what was the hurry of sending a Crips mission? Now, there was other reasons also for England. England was facing much problem from our east also because of the imperial functioning of Japan and the support of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, who was a huge leader, who was a charismatic leader, who had formed the Indian National Army and the support and the support was given to Japan at that time. Also, India had joined the war, but Britishers were, were having much setbacks in Europe and the third thing was that there was more trouble brewing for England in East. 
A very proud England had to surrender Singapore to Japanese in 1942. This is the picture of that surrender. Now England wanted India to be even more supportive and that is why they sent the Cripps mission. So the Cripps mission was sent okay, in March 1942 with two offers. One, they were ready to give us dominion status. Number two, they were ready to give us our constituent assembly. But they placed the condition. Condition? Yes. What condition? That both Indian National Congress and Muslim League must agree. However, there, there were certain offers, certain proposals by the Cripps mission which were not acceptable. One of them was that any province not willing to join the union could have a separate constitution and form a separate union. And that the defense of India would remain in British control. Congress was not happy because by this time Congress was expecting or rather demanding independent status rather than dominion status. Also, that we were not happy that the princely states will not have elected representatives. We were certainly not happy that you were giving right to provinces to separate from the Union of India. Also, we were not happy that we will have to wait for the transfer of power since we had already supported England in the war. We wanted immediate transfer of power. What was more surprising was that there was another side that was not happy, that was the Muslim League. The demand for Pakistan had started all the way back in 1930 with Muhammad Iqbal who was a famous Urdu poet, uh, demanding Pakistan. Then Chaudhary Rehmat Ali also had given the term Pakistan in 1933. And in the Laos session of Muslim League, they had already passed a resolution for that. So Muslim League, led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, did not accept the Cripps mission. And because neither the Muslim League nor the Indian National Congress were on the same page, Cripps mission failed. Because Cripps mission failed, in the Vardha meeting of Congress Working Committee, a resolution was passed on 8th August 1942 in Bombay. The What was the tagline or the motto, what was called as do or die, the Quit India Movement. And on 9th August 1942, the Quit India Movement, the amongst the most powerful movement against the Britishers was launched by Mahatma Gandhi. By this time, things were really really turning bad for England in terms of war deficiencies and etc and the damages in the European as well as in the Asian theatres of war. However, Britishers won the war certainly but after the war something happened. Nobody is able to answer this question but this is how electoral politics is all about. Churchill, the hero of the British victory in the World War II lost the elections in 1945 and the Labour Party won with Clement Attlee becoming the Prime Minister. Clement Attlee became the Prime Minister. Now he was very opposed to colonialism and some things also added to that. I hope you recall from Netaji Subhash Chandra's post Indian National Army, the officers of Indian National Army were arrested and they were uh, subjected to arrest at Red Fort in New Delhi. And they started a criminal trial was initiated against them, popularly called as the Red Fort Trials. So people of India were very, very emotionally involved with Dhillon and Shahnawaz Khans and so on and so forth. All of them were, we were very, very emotionally attached to Indian National Army soldiers and officers. And there was a mass emotion against these trials. And Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose's Indian National Army, it was the one which evoked that mass response. And what most people don't talk about, but that is true, is that there was a naval mutiny. So the Royal Indian Navy, there was a mutiny and the Britishers got too scared of that part. And Britishers decided to do something about it. So Lord Wavell decided to host what is called as a Shimla conference. He decided to bring both Muslim League and Indian National Congress and other stakeholders and other political parties to the same page to try and come to a conclusion so that we can go ahead with formation of Indian self-government. However, both the plan and the conference failed, but the second cabinet mission was sent nonetheless. On 15th March 1946, Lord Hartley, the Prime Minister of England, said in his own words that I recognize the right to self-determination of India and that is why he sent the second cabinet mission. The second cabinet mission proposed setting up of an interim government 
which would remain in office. But please remember, they continued to reject the demand for Pakistan. This was still not possible. An interim government was formed, but just prior to that, the constituent assembly elections took place. Out of the 389 seats that were said to be decided for the constituent assembly, 296 went for election, which were indirect elections to be uh, voted for by the members of the provincial legislative assemblies. Out of those 296 seats, 208 went to Indian National Congress, 73 to Muslim League and others won 15. The rest of the 93 members came from the princely states. Muslim League decided to boycott the constituent assembly and instead a direct action day, that is 16th August 1946, also known as the Great Calcutta Killings, saw hundreds and thousands of people slaughtered, killed during these communal riots. On 9 December 1946, we sat down to the first session of the Constituent Assembly, but things were really, really worsening. On February 20th, 1947, the Prime Minister, that is Clement Attlee, announced that we will transfer power. In other words, uh, the Britishers will leave India by 30th of June 1948. That means things had to be hurried up. And that is why Clement Attlee sent Lord Mountbatten who was the last Viceroy of British India. He got both Nehru and Jinnah to come across and to sit across the table on 3rd of June 1947. Lord Mountbatten gave what is popularly called as the 3rd June or the Mountbatten Plan. And for the first time ever, the demand for Pakistan was accepted. Please remember this. Lord Mountbatten's plan had to be given a legislative colour and that was given by the Indian Independence Act of 1947. The Indian Independence Act 1947 was introduced in the British Parliament on 5th July 1947 and was passed on 18th July 1947. Imagine the speed. If you pay attention to the words, it will be very easy for you to remember. An act to make provisions for setting up in India of two independent dominions to substitute other provisions for certain provisions of the Government of India Act 1935. In other words, British India was now to be divided from 15th day of August 1947. Two independent dominions shall be set up in India to be known respectively as India and Pakistan. These dominions will be called as new dominions and they will remain dominion only beginning from the appointed day of 15th August 1947 till that day that we have our own constitution. So India remained a dominion till 26 January 1950. So in a nutshell, this was the end of British rule from the appointed day of 15th August 1947. There will be no Her Majesty's or His Majesty's government. It was told that a new Governor General must be appointed only during the interim time period till the time you form your own constitution. Indian Constituent Assembly decided to have Governor General Lord Mountbatten continue. Each dominion will have its own constituent assembly and the doctrine of British paramountcy, I hope you recall what was the arrangement of suzerainty with the princely states shall lapse. In other words, it will be discontinued. Till such time that we will have our own constitution and interim constitution, that is the Government of India Act 1935 will continue. And this is what happened. India and Pakistan were ruthlessly divided. Even the library books were divided. and the boundaries were divided by what are called as the Radcliffe line. Radcliffe comes from the word or the Radcliffe was Cyrus Radcliffe who headed what is called as a boundary commission. This led to what is called as freedom at midnight. So at the stroke of midnight hour when the world sleeps, India woke to a new freedom. However, you may be wondering what happened to the princely states. This is what happened to the princely states. Thanks to Sadar Vallabhai Patel, most of the princely states were annexed by diplomatic means and some like Hyderabad, you can see in the picture, this is Nizam of Hyderabad and Junagar were annexed by military means. Either ways, this has happened and India became India, that is Bharat shall be a union of states. I hope my friends, the historic power portion of this is absolutely clear. I hope you appreciate that within the limited period of time that YouTube videos allow us, I can do only this much. If any of you 
hasn't wanting or they want really serious really intense preparation i welcome you to join our courses use my code said life join a one year course or join a two year course take your decision but take your decision now the exam is just around the corner it will be very soon that the government will announce the date so i hope you have clear understanding with this entire topic until next time my friends god bless and thank you in the words of one academy let's crack it